exam. Three is usually the lowest because it encompasses two concepts. Being able to differentiate correctly. So that's the calculus. The, the second component of the exam is algebra. Being able to set that equal to zero and solving for the roots of the derivative. So some of you lacked pretty heavily on differentiation, which if you cannot differentiate the function to begin with, you have no chance on the algebra. Some of you differentiated the function and then stopped because you didn't know what to do. Set it equal to zero and solve for your critical points. Some of you set it equal to zero and did some pretty crazy algebra to get some pretty crazy answers. So the three fronts, being able to differentiate, being able to know what to do with after you differentiate, and then being able to do algebra, if you, if you failed at any one of those, it was really hard to grade the, the uh, exam. So your scores, you can see where you fall in the course. 12 people got A's, 10 B's, 5 C's, 3 D's, and 9 F's. So that's with the curve. I will post the answers after class today. Just to kind of go through some of the common things I, I, I saw, number one was pretty straightforward. It was exactly like the one from your quiz, the stepwise. Um, number two was also like the one from the quiz. Some of you approximated at two, which I believe I took off a point for doing that because it wasn't the best approximation. Um, and being able to know what to pick your three not to be is, is an important part of that. Because you want to get point nine seven away is a lot further away than point zero three away. And this is a local linear approximation. Number three, I was so surprised, and it might not have been in this section, how many people differentiated e to the 2t as 2t e to the 2t? Some of you also put 2t e to the 2t minus 1. You treated it just like an x to a power, but it's not. The derivative of e to the 2t is 2 e to the 2t not 2t e to the 2t. So that was a little concerning there. Um, people put 2t e to the 2t here, which is, is concerning there. So Find the open intervals in which the function is increasing. I did an example like this in the notes where you had to factor out this e to the x because e to the x is never 0. And then you're ending up with a third degree polynomial factor out an x squared. You have a linear term. So you have the factors of 0 or negative 3. Plug that in a number line and make a conclusion. So pretty straightforward. Some of you were then trying to find the second derivative. I didn't ask for the second derivative, but I think you just got in that mindset. Okay, I take the derivative, I take the second derivative, I need to do that type thing. So um, number 5 was probably the second hardest one on the exam because of the algebra. The derivative, pretty straightforward. So I take the derivative of the first function, hold the second, plus the derivative of the second, hold the first. At this point, I should see that each one of these terms have a x plus 12 squared in common. So if I factor out an x plus 12, I'm left with an x plus 12 to the first power, plus 3x. Set that equal to 0, x equals minus 12, or 4x plus 12 equals 0. So I get the critical point minus 12 minus 3. Then I have an option if I can simplify the derivative, differentiate this using the product rule and the chain rule. The derivative of the first, hold the second, plus the derivative of the second, hold the first. Or I can go back up here to what I originally wrote as the derivative and differentiate term by term. So the derivative of the first term is 3x plus 12 squared plus the derivative of the second term is the product rule. The derivative of the first x is 1, so I'm left with 3 times x plus 12 squared. And the derivative of x plus 12 squared is 2 x plus 12 to the first power. So from here, I have an x plus 12 in common. So then I'm left with a 3 x plus 12 plus 3 x plus 12 plus 6 x. If I simplify that, add common terms, I get minus 12 and minus 6 test those points and I find that these are inflection points. So I agree that the algebra here is higher level than factoring a quadratic, 
But I definitely think it is something that is doable, and now that you've seen an example like this, it could be beneficial on the final exam if it pops up. Um, this one has popped up on the final exam in the past, so that's where I pulled it from. Number six was meant to be pretty straightforward. It's an easy 15 points here. A positive increasing function. You missed a point if it was ever decreasing or if it was ever below the axis. So you missed a point for each one of those. Decreasing negative and concave down. As long as you had a decreasing negative concave down function, you were fine. Decreasing and concave down. It turns out these two could be the exact same or this one could be above the x-axis because it doesn't say the function is negative. Inflection points. Some of you had some crazy functions there. It has to be decreasing, and it has to have an inflection point at zero. An example of a function like this would be minus x cubed. Decreasing positive and concave up. So my function is decreasing. It's always above the x-axis, and it's going to hold water. It's concave up. This is one example. Again, there's, there's other examples. I wish or I could have put more on it like this, but I didn't. So this means that the function is positive. It's always above the x-axis. This means the function is always increasing. The slope's always positive. And this is that it's concave down. So this function is positive, increasing, and concave down. Again, I don't know if this was your section or the other section, but so many people got stumped on how to differentiate x cubed over 3. You try to use the quotient rule. The quotient rule is fine. It will give you the right answer if you use the quotient rule correctly. A lot of you put the derivative of 3 as 3. The derivative of 3 is 0. So what is the derivative of x cubed over 3? 2x to the third of 3. It would be 3x squared over 3, right? The 3s would cancel, and you're left with x squared. So a lot of you differentiated these three terms correctly, but you didn't differentiate the first one, so you couldn't even begin to find the roots because you didn't have the right equation. So you're left with a, a quadratic here. You differentiate the quadratic, you get two critical points. Find all the relative extreme and values on this closed interval. So I need to test the endpoints and the critical values. Turns out at 10 I have a maximum. And that's all I wanted, the absolute maximum. Probably about four of the whole, four people in the whole class tested every single integer value between minus 10 and 10. There's no point to do that. The maximum minimums can only occur at critical points. Turns out the critical points are only <coughs> minus 6 and 4. And then they also can occur at the end point, so you'd need to test those. But it doesn't have to be an integer. It could have been easily been square root of 2. So by testing integers is just a waste of time. This one was pretty, I thought, pretty straightforward. A lot of you saw the paragraph and said, I'm not even going to read that. And I understand time was an issue, so a lot of you skipped this one. So I think it would be worth some time to look over again. So I have a rectangular fence. A rectangular lot is to be bounded by a fence on three sides and a wall on the fourth side. So I have a wall and then I have a fence. Two kinds of fence will be used. The heavy duty fence selling for $3 a foot on the opposite side of the wall. So it's going to cost me three times X to build X. The two remaining sides will use standard fencing. So the standard fencing costs $2 a foot. But there's two of them, y plus y, which is 2y. So it turns out I get this cost function, and I get this area function. So if I solve for y in the cost function, I can plug that in the area function for y, and I get a quadratic. Differentiating a quadratic, I get a linear term. Setting that equal to 0, I get a critical point. Now I need to test if that critical point is a minimum or a maximum. If I differentiate the area function again, I, I give negative 3 over 2, which tells me that the, the function is a quadratic that's pointing down. So the critical point is a maximum, which is exactly what I want. I plug that back in my formula for y, and then I get the dimensions for y. So the dimensions of the rectangle would be 5,760 by 4,320. 
So the, why don't you use perimeter to find the, your y value and plug it into your area equation? Perimeter of a rectangle? Yeah. I kind of do, except I, I take into account the cost. Because it costs different to build this fence than it costs to build this fence. Because the perimeter would be x plus 2y, right? But it cost me $3 to build x and $2 to build y. What would be your perimeter? Well, I put 2x plus 4y. I didn't, I didn't know where to put the wall. I didn't know if the wall It didn't matter. If you put it over here, then you're just switching the x and y, right? Because you'd have x, x, y, and you can switch the x and y, no problem. As long as you have your picture showing. It, it, as long as you have your picture showing which one, and as long as you get one to be 5,760 and the other one to be 4,320. Because if I have a rectangle like this, the same rectangle like this is fine. So if I have this is my wall with my rectangle, or if I have this is my wall as a rectangle, it's going to be the same thing. And then page nine, again, I know time was an issue and there was a curve, but um, pretty straightforward. A lot, I would say a few people had these correct, but didn't have a function for velocity or acceleration, which I was like, how did that happen? But um, it's pretty straightforward, differentiating a polynomial twice, setting it equal to zero, solving for two points, setting the acceleration equal to zero, solving for two points. I only have to take into account the positive t, because t is greater than or equal to zero. Plotting that on a number line gives me speeding up and slowing down. Pretty straightforward. So I will post this after class, and you can look that over. If anyone has any questions on grading, just let me know. Come see me, and I can look at how something is graded. If you have a question on, I added up my points, and I got a different number, give it to me and let me see that. I will post the scores, your raw score plus seven. So I will post the curve score on Blackboard. And um, so if you want to check that, make sure that's um, correct as well. And I will do that after class today. So, so if you didn't get your exam, oh wait, that's the you guys are section two, right? Okay, so I have Lee, Taylor, Lee, Stephen, Joey. Stephen. I'm on my second of the list. That is lost a number somewhere along the line. Joey. Angel. Laura. Matt. Nathan. Brian, yeah. Seth, yeah. Muhammad or Al Muhammad? Al Muhammad, Lawrence, so you add Seth. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't add the curve to anyone's grade. So your score plus seven, write that on your paper so that's what you need to know will be on Blackboard. Question. Uh, yeah. class, no, the four points came from the bonus on the exam. If you add up 12 plus 8, if you add up all the points possible, there's 104 points on the exam. So I usually write an exam to have these four floating bonus. But then on top of that, I gave you seven. How many points were we supposed to make? To make a, a decent curve? I would have probably just given you guys four or five, but then the other class, to, I gave them seven, so I didn't think it was necessarily fair to curve theirs and not curve yours because you guys are stronger than them consistently, so it wouldn't be fair to curve up their exam three and not yours at the same pace. So um, I'm sure it will come out on the final exam as it's been coming out all semester. So, question. Mm -hmm. um, so we take that out of our Wiley score, 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it's already I think uploaded in Blackboard as a quiz, quiz on on Wiley, and so yeah, you would take your your quiz scores, you would count that as one of them. So yeah, there's a little bit of stuff, but you, I mean, you guys should be on top of it. It's not exactly crystal clear, but you have the mathematical capability to to add up your quiz scores and divide by how many is possible. And you will take the best eight as soon as we have um, eight quizzes. More than eight quizzes, you'll be able to drop a few. Okay. So last time we discussed integration. And we had this notion of the antiderivative. So we had that table from our book, like the integral of x to a power is going to be x to the power plus 1 divided by the power plus 1. And then we also talked about the six different trig functions, differentiating them and integrating them. And then we talked about tangent inverse and sine inverse, knowing those formulas. So today, we're going to continue on this notion of integration, but we're going to look at a little bit more complicated integration formulas, and we're going to transform them into easier ones, integrate it, and then back substitute. So this is 5-3. This is a very popular method in calculus. This is integration by substitution. We will focus on U substitutions. When you get into Calc 2, you'll do more complicated substitutions like trig substitutions and then integration by parts and partial fraction decomposition. So as we're ending Calc 1, you're going to kind of begin in Calc 2 evaluating quite a bit more complicated integrals by different techniques. So this is really the only kind of tool we have in our toolbox to integrate when you get to that final exam in Calc 1. But this is just kind of the beginning of tools for integration. So what we're going to have here is a method of substitution. And our goal here is to transform complicated integration problems and two simpler ones. We've, we've dealt with the simpler ones from 5-2, and so now they have to be in a very specific form to be able to transform them into a simpler one. So let's recall from, calc let's recall from differentiation, if I take a derivative of a composition, So I'm differentiating a composition, right? That's the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside function times the derivative of the inside function. Do you guys remember that? So the anti-differentiation is going to go the other way. So if I integrate this with respect to x, and I integrate this side with respect to x, it turns out that the integral cancels with the derivative, and I'm left with f of g of x. That equals the integral of the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside, dx. This is a very important concept because what we're wanting to do here is we're wanting to find what this inside function is, and we're going to call that u. Right? So we're going to let u equal g of x. We have absolutely full control over what we pick u to be. But once we have our u, we're locked into du. So then here, du would be the derivative of g with respect to x times dx, which is nice because do you see this right here? That is exactly what we have here. Ian? Um, or Evan? Yeah. Sorry, I called you Ian. <laughs> Are those actually equivalent? Yes. They're equal to each other. Oh, you just drew the you just drew the integral thing in the yeah. top line. If I integrate both sides here, 
I'm left with this here and the integral of this here. So what I'm really getting at here that if I let u be g of x, I really have f of u equals the integral of, let's see if I want to write this, f prime of u du. So this is meant as just kind of a general example in any terms, but let's use some real examples and then we can see what the function is and what the derivative of the function is pretty straightforward. So let's look at an example. If I wanted to integrate x squared plus 1 to the 50th power times 2x dx, for examples, we'll start out seeing exactly what u is and exactly what du is. But as we get going, we might need to manipulate the integral to find du or to get it in exact form for what du is in terms of dx. Do you guys see the composition here? I have an inside function to the 50th power times the derivative of the inside function. So what would I want u to be? x squared plus 1. So we're free to pick u. But once we've picked u, we have to find du from that. So du is 2x times dx. Does everyone see that I'm getting du from differentiating x squared plus 1? Mm -hmm. It just turns out to be 2x dx, which is exactly what I have here. All right? So this is... Is that always going to be true? No. It will always have to end up being true that it might be off by constant and you have something to manipulate it. So if this 2 wasn't here, I would have to put the 2 here and then divide by a 2 so it end up with 1 half as a constant to pull out. You can always manipulate it by a constant. If you manipulate the top and bottom by a constant, you haven't changed the integral. So here, rewriting this, I would have the integral of u to the 50th times du. Do you see at this point I have only an integral in terms of u? You have a problem if your integral is in terms of u and x or u and a dx. You know that you've done something wrong in the previous step or you didn't make the right u substitution. It has to cancel and only be in terms of u. But now, this is a very easy integral to integrate. What's the integral of u to the 50th? U to the 51 over 51. Good. U to the 51 over 51 plus c. But I don't want the integral in terms of u. I want it in terms of x. So I just back substitute. So it turns out this is x squared plus 1 to the 51st power divided by 51 plus c. So this would be my answer here. So just a note, you have control over u, but not du. Once you pick your u, you're locked into what du is. You can't say, oh, I'll just pick du to be 2 times x. It has to be the derivative of what you pick u to be. So you want to pick u conveniently that the derivative is going to cancel out anything else. Amanda? When you take the d, like I get how d is the same mm -hmm. up there, but then when you take the integral of it, mm -hmm. where is the du going? Here, anytime you have a dx, that's relating with the integral. The du is relating with the integral. So I'm just integrating the integrand, which is this function. And this function has to be a function of u. So it's kind of like when we took the derivative, we took it with dx, or dt, or okay. dp. So here I'm integrating with respect to x, here I'm integrating with respect to u. Okay. okay. And, and a lot of times u is called a dummy variable. So it's like, you know, everywhere I input an x, so if I input x to be 1, really u is 2. If I input x to be 2, really u is 5. 
So if I just make that switch, as long as I keep up what du is in terms of dx, I've just kind of just done a dummy dummy switch there, integrated it to make it easier, and then plug it back in terms of what x really is. So you have complete control over u and not du. So let's just look at an example where this comes in. We're not going to finish this one because after we do a u substitution, it turns out to be a calculus 2 integral. So we don't have the, the uh, tools to go ahead and integrate it, but I want to show you how you can pick a u conveniently. Question? You know, like um, the u there, I think it's the same thing with uh, um, x squared plus 1 to the fifth power. Is it always the same thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> like when we um, differentiate um, 2x, we got x squared plus 1. And in the normal equation, it's like x squared plus 1 to the fiftieth power also. Okay, so I'm yeah. picking u to be x squared plus 1. Because when I substitute that in, I have u to the 50th. If I pick u to be x squared plus 1 to the 50th, I would have du is 50 x squared plus 1 to the 51st. Sorry, 49th. Sorry. Integration differentiation. Yeah, so if I differentiated, and I wouldn't have that to cancel. So I couldn't su substitute this whole thing to be u because I wouldn't have a x plus or an x squared plus 1 to the 49th to cancel it. So I have to pick u to be where I have the du to cancel, or at least off by a constant. So just a comment here, if I want to integrate 2x sine of x to the 4th dx, what would I pick my u to be? I would need to pick a u to be when I differentiate it, something cancels to make my integral easier. Sine of x. What is the derivative of sine? Cosine. Do I have a cosine in this integral to cancel? No. Uh, I, get it. Two x. I have a 2x. And if I take the derivative of 2x, I get 2, which is just a constant. So then I would have u sine of x to the fourth, and I would have a problem there. Cause so x to the fourth, we're getting closer, but what's the derivative of x to the fourth? 4x cubed, and I don't have an x cubed to cancel. If we do the whole thing, then we don't, have, we don't have it to cancel. We have to have the derivative to cancel. 2x to the fourth would be 8x cubed, and I don't have an x cubed to cancel. I, I can't cancel sine because I'd have to have cosine. X squared. X squared is a good idea. So if I let u equal x squared, du is 2x dx, which is nice, because I cancel that. So I would have the integral of sine of u squared, du, right? Because x squared squared is x to the fourth. So this one, it, it turns out this one is a integral you will deal with in Calc 2, so we don't have the techniques to. But that's one example of showing that you have complete control over u. But you have to pick a u conveniently that it's going to cancel. So you have to see the derivative of u at least somewhere in the integral or off by a constant. If this 2 wasn't here, it, I would still make the substitution x squared. And then I would just have to divide through by a 2. Question? Um, can, with just regular values, I mean, it seems like these values were picked conveniently. So yes. Like, we does will this happen very often? Well, in the beginning it does. <laughs> because we're just trying to, you know, get you used to seeing this composition and then the derivative of the inside, right? F of g of x times g prime of x. So a lot of times it's right there. But we'll do some examples where you have to manipulate the constant to get it in that exact form. So let's look at um, just kind of making a note here. Your book gives you some guidelines. For U substitution. This is on page 334 in your book. I don't want to take the time to write it down, um, but I do think it would be useful. Um.
um, to just look at it and read over it. And then you can recall it and look in the book. So I have got this on here. So step one, the first thing you should do is you look, look for some composition, some inside function, some outside function, and then the derivative of that inside function. So if you see that, then you go ahead and make a guess on what you want u to be to be that inside function. And then you find a u. So if you're successful in finding a u and a du, you go ahead and make that substitution. If you have an integral and only in terms of u that you can integrate, you've done it. If you have a u and an x, you have done something wrong. And you also want to make sure that you rewrite dx in terms of du. So you can solve for that or you can manipulate it. And I'll show you two examples of that. And then if you're successful and you have an integral in terms of u, you go ahead and integrate in terms of u, and then you back substitute what you let u be in terms of x. So you can read over those, those guidelines, but let's just do some examples. So let's look at a pretty straightforward one. Let's say the integral of sine of x plus 9 dx. What am I going to pick to be u? x plus 9. And it's going to work out nicely if u is x plus 9. What is du? What's the derivative of x plus 9? 1. <laughs> dx. No, I'm good that you got to throw it out there to see. Okay, so the derivative of x plus 9 is, is 1, and that's with respect to x. So here, do you see that dx equals du? So this is really convenient, because when I go to substitute this, I have the integral of sine of u times du. We've done it. We've got an integral in terms of u only, with respect to u. What is the integral of sine of u? Negative cosine. Negative cosine, right? So I get negative cosine of u plus c. And then my last step to write it in terms of x. So I'd have minus cosine of x plus 9 plus c. Okay, let's do a very similar example, but let's put the derivative of u to be something other than 1. So if I have the integral of sine, say, 6x plus 9 dx. What am I going to pick to be u? Where's 3x at? 3x squared. What, what am I going to want? What is something that, so what's the outside function? What's the inside function? So let's say u equals 6x plus 9. What's du? Six times dx, right? Because the derivative of six is with respect to x. So now I don't have a six dx to cancel. There's kind of two techniques here. I can come in here and say, I'm going to write a six here, and then I'm going to divide by six. That's only one, right? Six over six is one. I have not changed it. Then I perfectly have a six dx, and I can replace that with du. So there's one method. Can you just ignore the 6 that you wrote? In the denominator, you pull it out front because it's a constant. Okay. You don't want to forget about it. So here I would have 1, 6, the integral of sine of u, du. So it's kind of your first, your first method. Personally, I prefer the second method. The second method is to solve for dx. So if I write dx, I get du divided by 6. Then I just replace this for what dx is, and I get du over 6, and I pull that 1, 6 out. Both methods will give you the same answer. So here, this is dx. If I replace what dx is 
So here I would have the integral of sine of u times dx, but that's du over 6. So I end up with the exact same thing. Question? When you go to, is it called integrating it? It's like the next step that you would do after that. Right? Once you, yeah, when you integrate it, you drop the integral sign. So when you have the sine u of du, if that was all over 6, uh, yes. you would have to pull that 6 out before you go to the You wouldn't point. have to, but it's just kind of, you could leave it there. But sometimes it can, where you, you might have another constant to deal with. So if you pull all your constants out front, you can deal with them at the end. You can leave it in there. The integral of sine over 6 is going to be the 1 over 6, the integral of sine. So it doesn't matter. You could leave it all there personally. This will be very beneficial if you get in this habit in Calc 2, if you go to Calc 2, because there's different techniques that you're like, hey, I'm going to pull this constant out and deal with it. And sometimes it cancels nicely, and sometimes you can wait until the end, because if you, if you multiply that out to every term, it can be cumbersome and easy to, to mess up, where if you say I'm going to hold it to the very end until I get a number, and then multiply it by that number, or multiply it by that function. Okay, so I have 1, 6. What is the integral of sine of u? The integral of sine is minus cosine, just like we did here, right? Plus c. And now I'm going to write that in terms of x. So I have minus cosine of 6x plus 9 plus c. So my answer would be minus cosine of 6x plus 9 divided by 6 plus c. Is the c not divided by 6? c is any constant. So any constant divided by 6 is any other constant. Okay. So, yeah, you can just leave it as c. c over 6 is the same as some c. But, yeah, that's a good question. So let's do another example. The integral of x minus 8 to the 23rd dx. Could anyone tell me the answer? What would be the answer? Exactly, right? So as you get more and more experience doing these, you kind of start seeing um, how the answers come out. So u equals x minus 8. du is simply dx, right? So this was just a, a dummy transformation to get it to u to the 23rd. And that comes relatively quick. And we know the integral of u to the 23rd is u to the 24th over 24 plus c. So if I replace this, I have x minus 8 to the 24 over 24 plus c. But be a little bit careful, because if I have the integral of 2x minus 8 to the 23rd dx, what would my answer be? You see where that one half would come in? Because the derivative of the inside would be 2. So I really need this to be 2 over 2 to get it to, to be complete. So I'm so sometimes you can get a little cocky and you lose a constant. So be really careful on that. Does that make sense? When the derivative of the inside, when the derivative of your u is dx, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. But when it's something other than dx, you have to be very careful that you know what to do with that constant. Are you multiplying that constant or are you dividing that constant? In this case, the derivative is 2 dx, so I need a 2 there, so I'm dividing by 2. Okay. Um, so let's look at um, another example. This is the integral of sine squared x times cosine of x. 
What am I going to have my U be? Sine. Because the derivative of a sine is cosine. And that cosine of dx is going to cancel nicely. And I'm going to have u squared. I can integrate u squared. So we're going to let u equal sine of x. du would be cosine of x times dx. I have that completely. So I can have the integral of u squared times du. If I solve for dx, I would have du over cosine. So when I plug that in, the cosines would cancel, and I would have just du. So you can go that method as well. If I have the integral of u squared times cosine of x times du over cosine of x, you can see that the cosines of x cancel nicely. Okay, Amanda? I'm way behind you, but um, why up on the top one? Here? Why it, it could. A constant's a constant. A constant divided by 2 is just a new constant. So you don't have to manipulate your constant by any other constant. It's any constant okay. plus so C. Any constants. any constants and every constant. Okay. So that if I differentiate this, I get what I originally started. And the derivative of any constant is 0. So constant over 2 is also 0. Make sense? Okay. So back here, do you guys see how I got this integral in terms of u only? What's the derivative, or sorry, what's the integral of u squared? u cubed over 3, and then there's a plus c. So then if I back substitute u with sine, so I end up with the answer is sine cubed of x over 3 plus c. You can always check your work here. I've integrated, and I got an answer. If I differentiate that answer, I should get my original function. So let's check that. What is the derivative with respect to x of sine cubed x over 3 plus c? Well, that would be 3 sine squared x times cosine of x over 3 which is, is what I originally started with, right? So then I did that correctly. So the sine cube of x is sine squared. I differentiated it. What is the derivative of sine cubed of x over 3? Well, that'd be 3 sine squared of x times cosine, because the derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. So that's 3 sine squared x times cosine divided by 3. The 3 is canceled. I get what I originally started with. So you use the chain rule. I use the chain rule, the chain rule on differentiating this function. Okay. Um, so let's look at another example. 1 divided by 1 third x minus 8 to the fifth power dx. What is my u substitution here? What am I going to pick to be u? Do I want it to the fifth? Because the derivative of that would be 5 1 third x minus 8 to the fourth. And I wouldn't have that to cancel. So I would want to pick u to be 1 third x minus 8. So then du is 1 third dx. So now if I solve for dx, I have 3 du. So this would be kind of my method instead of multiplying by 3 and divided by 3. I know that for everywhere I have an x, I'm going to replace that with 3. Sorry, everywhere I have a dx, I'm going to replace that with 3 du. So this would be the integral of 1 over u to the fifth times 3 du. So I can take 3, the integral. What's another way to write u to the fifth? Sorry, 1 over u to the fifth? Very good. u to the minus fifth du, which would be 3. What is the integral of u to the minus fifth? Do 
mu to the minus 4 divided by minus 4. So now if I back substitute in terms of what u is in terms of x, I have 3 times 1 third x to the minus 8 to the minus 4 over minus 4 plus c. And there's my answer there. I can check my work. If I take the derivative of this, I have minus 4, which is going to cancel with minus 4 on bottom. My, 1 third x minus h to the minus 5 times the derivative of the inside, which is a third, so that 3 cancels. And I end up with 1 third x minus h to the minus 5, which is exactly what I had here. Does anyone have any questions? Some of you are looking a little unsure. Question? You can write it 3du. Yes. And the next step, how do you write that? Is it that this one equals 3, the integral of u to the fifth du? Yes. Remember that theorem that we learned? That the integral of a constant times a function with respect to x is a constant times the integral of the function. And uh, 5.2, we've talked about that theorem. So I can pull that 3 out front. Same thing if you had a third, you could pull that out front. So I want to just deal with the function in terms of u. So I pull that 3 out. You could leave it as 3 u to the minus 5 and then know that it's going to be multiplied by 3. And that's perfectly fine. Question? Well, if you keep the u in the denominator, when you integrate that, does that, I mean, could you do that really quick? So here, yeah, so if I come here and I have 3, the integral of 1 over u to the 6 du, sorry, 5th. Well, remember the, the formula is the integral of x to the r dx is x to the r plus 1 over r plus 1 plus c. So we have to get this in the form of x to a power. So I couldn't say 1 over u to the 6 over 6 or something like that. No, you need to get the only, the reason why this works is because the power of your variable is in the numerator. So you always want to manipulate this up to the numerator and then deal with it there. And so... Yeah, so it, yeah, it was not correct. So here, this only works when r doesn't equal minus 1. In the case when you have 1 over x dx, this is ln, the absolute value of x plus c. So that, those, that encompasses anything of x to a power. If the power is a fraction, you're good. Question? So the difference be why it was 3 instead of 1 third is because of where your fraction was? Because it was a fraction in the denominator before, so you had um, the reason in the numerator, so you had divided by three or one third, mm -hmm. and so since it's in the denominator this time, you multiply by three. Well, the reason why it I multiply by three because I need one third dx. So if I wanted one third dx, if I multiply this over three, dx over three is du. So I'm left with the three in the numerator. A lot of times I name three dx, so I'm left with the three in the denominator. Does that make sense there? Okay. So um, let me just have time to do one more example. And let's look at the integral of 1 over 1 plus 3x squared dx. Does this look like something familiar? Yeah. What's Inverse. Inverse. Inverse of tangent. So recall that the integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared du would simply be tangent inverse of u plus c. So I need to manipulate this to be 1 over 1 plus u squared. So that means I need to pick something that when I plug it in that box and square it, I get 3x. So what would I pick u to be? Well, 3x squared would be 9x squared. 
I need to pick something that I squared, I get 3x squared. Very good. So this would be the square root of 3 times x, right? Because then u squared would be 3x squared, which is exactly what I want to put in there. So du would be the square root of 3 dx. So if I solve for dx, I get du equals dx equals du over square root of 3. So I have the integral of 1 plus 1, 1 over 1 plus 1 over u squared. The dx is du over square root of 3. So I can pull out 1 over square root of 3, and I get the integral of 1, oops, getting ahead of myself, 1 divided by 1 plus u squared du. 1 over square root of 3, this would be tangent inverse of u plus c. But I don't want my in, I don't want it to be in terms of u, I want it to be in terms of x. So the last step here is to write it in terms of x, which would be tangent inverse of the square root of 3x plus c. And if you drop the brackets, that's perfectly fine. Question? Yes? Because the square root of x squared is just x, and I mean it to be x squared. All right, we will finish up this section tomorrow. Um, keep in mind, quiz on Thursdays over 4, 8, and 5, 2.